So uh, we shall now move on to um, the next speakers, two in fact. Um, views from Madame uh, Julie Ho, she's principal of the Raffles Girls School, Singapore, and Mrs. Mary Sheryan, uh, she's director of the Pedagogical Research Laboratory, the Raffles Girls School, Singapore. They'll be talking under the topic of differentiated instructions for the differentiated classrooms. Ladies and gentlemen, Madame Ho and Mrs. Cherian. Right. Well, a very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Sawadika. It's my third year at Educa, and it has been a complete privilege and pleasure uh, to come back every year. And I want to thank the organizers of Educa for giving me this opportunity again to meet up with a wonderful educators and academics and policy makers I have met in the last three years. I've always been very moved by the experiences and um, the knowledge and the sharing that you have given me. Every time I've been here, I feel a great sense of urgency. I feel a great determination to constantly improve uh, with Thailand's education system. And I think that, you know, looking at the sponsors and the collaborators of Educa, it speaks of a very strong tripartite concern because the corporate, the government, and the schools and universities are working together to bring together such a conference. And that speaks, that speaks a lot about your intention to really, really move on with improvement. Um, this morning we've heard from Sir Michael Barber and um, Sir Michael has taken us to the 10,000 10, feet high altitude perspective on school systems and school reforms across the world. Uh, we've also heard from Professor Leumann from Finland and uh, his perspectives and insights and wisdom on curriculum development, asking really essential questions about curriculum. Where we have the privilege as Raffles Girls School from Singapore to be a part of this dialogue and session really is, and I thank the organizers for putting this session in because we hope to bring to you the perspective from the every, the smallest unit of any education system, and that is the school. How every school plays a very central and important part um, in the reform, um, that the, which is a national movement. Um, this morning, something that um, Kun Xinchai said in his opening about how even though there are very urgent concerns, like the flood situation in Thailand, he reminded us all that a very current priority like this is not delinked from education. And in fact, it is because of education and what we do in education to bring out the best in every child that we will be able in future to avert situations like the flood. And I think that's a really important concept to bear in mind because if we do not remember the child and the school that serves the child in education, we would have wasted our time in our work. So we're hoping to bring the perspective of today's dialogue to centralize and focus on providing the best possible instruction to every child, which is really one of the three success factors. If you have read the executive summary and the report that was put out, um, which is Sir Michael Barber's work for McKinsey and Company in 2007, three factors. First, teacher quality. Secondly, effective instructors. And thirdly, the best possible instruction for every child. And I ask myself, what is the best possible instruction for every child? That basically assumes that you must ask yourself what is best for every unique child. So we need to be tailoring schools and systems contextually. So a lot of these have been in, in the keynotes that have been presented um, this morning. Remind us that systems need to really be pushing and pulling. What is top down and bottom up, there is a tension and systems develop Right? Um, and every system has its own trajectory and pathway of growth. We need to be able to, in 
all our systems be able to find that right balance between what is top down and what is bottom up and allowing our schools to make local decisions because they know best what their children need. So this is really the perspective that you know, we in RGS hope to be able to share. We have a narrative to present, but we are part of a larger Singapore system. And I hope to be able to really do justice to um, this half hour that we've been given. I have invited a co-speaker to join me, and Mrs. Cherian will actually give you details about curriculum differentiation in Raffles Girls School. And this is us. And just to frame it and contextualize it, this is taken from the synopsis for this particular dialogue session, and we are focusing on what are the challenges of leading education systems in educating their people for a knowledge economy. These are indeed global issues facing many school systems today. Um, but successful curriculum and instruction reform, has the, it has different success factors, and the achievement relies on whether you eventually are able to sustain that achievement in the long term. Right? So how is school-wide reform done and achieved? Now, we've tailored our presentation and our sharing with you in response to this challenge that is presented here. And as per the request of the organizers, we are therefore speaking on our experience in differentiated instruction for a differentiated classroom. So this is us, uh, school reform in line with systemic reform, a narrative from RGS. Right. And I just want to present that, that larger perspective uh, about our national reform in, in Singapore. And this was also something very recently reminded to us by our Minister for Education because we are a very new country, as you all will know. Right? Uh, we only came to self-government in 1959. We, are, we have just celebrated 46 years of independence as a nation. But in that space of time, we have seen how education in our country has had to support and in fact shape the very complexion of our country. There's a line that comes in the letter of appointment for every principal in a Singapore school. And this to me is a very important line because it reminds me of the weight of my responsibility as a school leader. And I'd like to share that line with you. Through your hands passes the future of the nation. And that must remind us what our work must be about. We are molding the future of our nations and schools collectively, systems collectively across the world are therefore involved in the same work we are as educators, shaping the future of the world. It's really, really important to remind ourselves of that. So in Singapore, the education system has evolved to support national change, nation building, national growth. And over the years, we've actually seen our system grow from one that is very much survival driven as a young country Moving on to efficiency driven, where we then look forward to being able to get greater productivity, putting more, more people in schools and producing more graduates for the economy. And eventually, in the late 90s, moving on to something that is far more familiar to us today, which is ability driven education. So in the context of this, really, our minister has also reminded us, and as educators in Singapore, we are all very, very much aware of this, that there are certain key fundamentals, and I've really just picked out three, which for me has always made so much sense and has always reminded us that as educators, the real question to ask about education change is not what must be changed. And I'd really like to share this, this perspective with you. The real question for me to ask about what education change should be is what should not be changed. Because then the space for change, it's a very easy answer. Because the question to be asked is, what needs to be changed, therefore, would be what would the children's needs be, and what would be the economy's needs, and what are the nation's needs, and what are the world's needs. So what should not change should always be unwavering. And for us, the fundamentals have been this. Education in Singapore has always focused on holistic development. And this is something that is more recently conceptualized 
for us as an education system. And if you looked at this diagram, this is what conceptualizes what for us we believe to be a fully educated person who can be a meaningful contributing citizen, someone who can take on life in its fullest meaning and negotiate the world and the changes that come with the world's changes. Well, if you look at that, it really looks at holistic education. It looks at cognitive, moral, aesthetic, physical domains of education in every way. This guides us as schools in translating the curriculum and the programs for our children. Second fundamental, which for me is really important, is that no matter what change has taken place, no matter how policy initiatives have changed to continue to shape the education system, rigor and high standards must always be key. And we've always set ourselves very high expectations. These are the PISA results for Singapore. 2009 was the first time Singapore took, took part in PISA. And this has been very encouraging. And this four schools on the ground really allows us to understand what our work does with the children in terms of helping them really rise to, to their potential in the world. Right? So we're very, very, um, this is hard, heartwarming, very encouraged. Uh, these are the results for Singapore. And in terms of rigor and high standards, in line with what McKinsey's report shows, we too find that we have the same philosophy, that quality outcomes can only come from quality teachers. And if you're familiar with our system, we have put a lot of emphasis on selecting only the best from the top one third of every cohort to be in the teaching service. And after that, we train our teachers well, we look into professional development, and increasingly schools are taking charge in terms of creating that network of learning across schools for our teachers. And the third fundamental that I'd like to share with you really is about diversity. Going back to the best possible instruction for every child, inherent in that statement is an understanding of heterogeneous needs, diverse needs. Every child is different. And hence, every school that has charge of these children will necessarily also need to be different. Now, if you've been to Singapore, and I trust many of you know Singapore, these are not pictures from Singapore. There are no four seasons in Singapore. It's just hot, hot, hot. But I chose these pictures because they remind me that every child takes a different path. And in our system, we have developed ways and means for different children so that they can take different tracks and pathways through the ed educational experience. But what, what is important is whether you are put on a more academically inclined track or a vocational training track, every one of those tracks is important because it allows the child to take a pathway that brings out his unique potential. Once on a pathway, the other thing to remember is this. Bridges and ladders must be incorporated into the system so that they can, at their own pace and according to their own aspirations, move up those pathways. They can cross from one pathway to another. There's the bridge. They can continue to move upwards so that personal aspirations can be fulfilled. Those are your ladders. No one needs to stay on one pathway and have no means of moving upwards through the educational system. So that is, those are the fundamentals that we have put in place. I'd like to, for the topic of our session here about curriculum differentiation and reform, I'd like to zoom in a little bit and focus on the diversity. Diverse needs, there is a sort of paradox in here. As a fundamental, as a constant, it has been a constant which has driven change. What do I mean by that? Education reform in Singapore has continually reinvented itself simply because we know the children have very, very diverse needs. Right? One of the more strategic reform movements in order to increase and diversify our pathways for the children has been the more recent initiative which we call the Integrated Program Schools Initiative. This was launched in 2004. Now what is the IP Schools Initiative? In short, top schools were liberated from the national exams. 
So the children that come to us in these schools, and Raffles Girls School is one of these integrated program schools, they do not have to sit for the national exams because they are already university bound. What then do we mean by that? These are children who are in the top 10% of their cohort. They are university bound. The question is, do you need for so many national exams to already to prove what we know they are capable of doing? Put simply, with the time spent on preparing them to do well in those exams, could we have done something more for them? Life skills, 21st century skills, leadership, all of that that has been talked about this morning. Ethical thinking, greater knowledge, greater integration between knowledge, thinking, and leadership, greater personhood. So these are schools focused on doing this work. Why? Why? Because the belief is that schools make the best local decisions in terms of curriculum, in terms of programming, in terms of teacher training and teacher development. All focused and converging on what the child needs. So we're given full autonomy to differentiate our curriculum and instruction to better fulfill student potential and better meet our student needs. Now let me just introduce very quickly my school, Raffles Girls School, Singapore. The RGS context really is this. We admit the top 1% to 3% of every primary school leaving cohort. And they come in with the highest academic scores. In our terms, the entire school is therefore a gifted and talented school. And that drives the principles of our curriculum. We see every girl as being a very gifted and talented girl. The question is, what do we do in helping her realize her full potential? Others are admitted to us based on very specific gifts in very specific domains, and therein lies our challenge. So even though they come to us as very homogeneous, high-ability children, they also come to us as very diverse children with very diverse talents. They may be very high-performing in music, or in the visual arts, or in specific academic domains. I have math geniuses who are capable of taking undergraduate courses at age 14. But she may be a really ordinary girl in any other discipline. So even within a school like ours, we have to be able to continue to differentiate for their needs. We are the top girls school, and I'd like to share with you our piece of results. Uh, from 2009. From our results, it shows us that RGS's mean scores sits above the 90th percentile of all Singapore schools' norms. Right? And I'm showing you the chart that actually indicates that the girls are performing very well, uh, with scores above 650, and certainly scores that sit above even schools that compare well with us in Singapore. So in essence, this is the context of RGS, and I'd like to, and what I've tried to do really is to present to you who we are and why we are who we are in the larger context of national reform in education in Singapore. I'd like to invite my co-speaker, Mrs. Cherian, to then take you on the RGS journey, right, which is a story of autonomy in curriculum reform. Uh, Mrs. Cherian, please. Morning. Uh, before I go on to talk about the details of this, of the curriculum reform, I just want to say that I'm really honored to be here, especially after having uh, got to know some of you. I know I'm in the right place. So let me just carry on with what uh, Julie has been uh, talking about. She spoke about the, the profile of the school and the need, therefore, to differentiate our curriculum in order to meet those needs. And that's going to be the, really the focus of uh, the next few slides. So the question that we've been asking because of the nature of the uh, Raffles Girl student is this question, is the curriculum differentiated to cater to their learning needs? And before I go on to answer that question, let's just look at the definition of differentiation. And I'm going to use the definition by Caroline Tomlinson, where curriculum differentiation is the adaptation in the content, product, and learning environment in response to student readiness, interests, learning profile to ensure the appropriate challenge and support. 
And the two words that I want to bring attention to is adaptation and response. The, the, the implication here is that whatever change that we make is because of the nature of the students. So it is not just arbitrary, it is not just by chance. So again, just, just to look at differentiation within the RGS context. In RGS, the adaptations, the changes, the, the modifications, the adjustments are made to the mainstream curriculum which is prescribed for the national schools. If you remember what Julia just said, we are an, inter we are an integrated program school which doesn't offer the, old, the, the, the uh, national curriculum anymore. So what we do is that we have made some adaptations to that curriculum so as to cater to the high ability girls. So what are these features? And I'm going to go into some details. What differentiates the RGS curriculum from the mainstream cu curriculum? And to do this, I'm going to just focus on a few elements of the curriculum, and I'm going to highlight particularly what are the principles that um, uh, influence the way we have adjusted the curriculum. Just a few uh, elements of the curriculum. Firstly, the curriculum design. How do we design the whole syllabus? And to do that, the principles that we have used to guide that is this model, the integrated curriculum model. Uh, this is by Professor Joyce Van Tessel Besker from the Gifted Education uh, Unit, and she's uh, from the United States. We have adopted her, uh, a model which focuses on advanced content, his high ability students, so the content is advanced, higher order process and product, overarching concepts with real world relevance. Now, it is, I can argue that this can be suitable for every student, and indeed, I mean, every student should be able to learn in this way. But we're going to make, what we've done is to make this fundamental to the curriculum. So in practice, because this is our model, advanced content, higher order process and product, overarching concepts, what you actually see in the, uh, in the RGS curriculum is that we have used curriculum maps Curriculum maps, uh, again, it's an idea by Heidi Hayes Jacobs, and the curriculum map is adapted to align with the integrated curriculum model and the understanding by design principles. And I'll talk a bit about understanding by design principles. I'm gonna use an example just to have an idea of what we mean. This is an example of a curriculum map of a secondary, a year two topic in history. Uh, don't worry about the details. I just want to focus a few on some of the elements of this curriculum map. Now, in this curriculum map, if you look, the topic is on pre-modern Singapore and the founding of Singapore. It's a very straightforward topic, year two students. But what I want to take, uh, particularly bring attention to are the kind of questions that guide a straightforward topic, like why was Singapore founded, what happened. But there are certain essential questions, such as, is it possible to have a fair treaty between nations? what defines a historical uh, figure, the concept of colonialism. And then we've got some big ideas about change, big ideas about the process of writing history, the big ideas about the interpretation of history. And then we have, of course, the knowledge and skills. We have even a column on ethics and traits, and then the assessments. Uh, what I want to again highlight are just two very important points. Firstly, this format is used in every topic, for every level, in every subject. So it's used school-wide. And that's one of the things which I would like to really share with you, that in doing a reform and to sustain a reform, it is important to do it as a school-wide reform. And it's important to expect all teachers to do it. And the second important point is adaptation here. Uh, this, a lot of what we see here, as much as I said that I've applied the concept of the integrated curriculum model, as well as the curriculum mapping model, this has been adapted to the RGS context. Now let's look at unit planning. So just now it's on curriculum design, the, uh, the, how we drew up our curriculum. How do we draw up our unit plan? The principles that we use, again, largely guided by the principles of the understanding by design, um, and here, what we particularly liked about this understanding by design framework, it's a framework to draw up a curriculum. What we liked about it is this whole notion of backward design. Backward design is a habit, a discipline, where you ensure at all times 
that your curriculum objectives, your assessment, and your instruction are aligned and are integrated. What we also like about understanding by design framework is that it focuses on the big ideas, on concepts. I gave you the example just now. It's about founding of Singapore. Why was Singapore founded? But we talked about the concepts of colonialism, leadership, the writing of history. So those are the kind of elements that we want to see in the curriculum. So how, how is it seen? What do you see? Uh, if, again, I'm going to give an example of how it looks like and how a typical unit plan which we designed how will it look like? And the same thing, from just now I showed you the uh, syllabus about the founding of Singapore. How does it look like in an actual unit plan? Um, it's, it's, it's whatever we saw in the curriculum map is put into the curriculum, into the unit plan where you have the objectives and then you, it goes on to go on to the uh, assessment and then it goes on to go on to the, uh, to the what is the learner experiences or the instruction. So the, basically the unit plan outlines what are you going to be doing in the class. Again, don't worry about the details, but a point I'm trying to make is that it's the same thing, that this is done as a format across all subjects and it's again adapted. And the main feature is that it want, uh, the focus on high ability and the focus on uh, critical thinking. To look at assessment, uh, assessment is I think for many of our, in our societies, and certainly in the Singapore context, assessment is under a lot of scrutiny. We use uh, the, these principles to align, our, uh, to, to focus on how assessment is designed. Very much, we talk about alignment. Assessments must be aligned to the curriculum and to the instruction, must be aligned to the objectives. We focus on formative and summative assessments. Formative assessments, assessments for learning, summative assessment, assessment of learning. And we also focus on multiple modes. Again, in our context, uh, talking about the Singapore context and in largely, I think, the Singapore, uh, Asian context, very much a lot of focus is on the standardized pen and paper testing. So we still have that, but we, we also want to focus on other forms of assessment. So aside from the time-based assessment, we also look at applied understandings. One of the examples that we have is the performance task. The performance task is an alternative assessment where students do it over a period of time and there's a real world context to it. Uh, and it is a summative assessment. And we've been doing this over the last uh, five years or so. And the other form is growth over time uh, through journals and portfolios. Now finally, let's look at instruction. So they're all aligned. It's, it, the, the curriculum design is aligned to the unit plan and the unit plan, within the unit plan itself, you have the objectives, assessment, instruction. It's all integrated. That, that's the main point uh, I would like to make here. So in the terms of the instruction, a key principle is higher order thinking. And we've heard um, in the earlier speaker, Professor Leumann, who spoke quite a bit about the very importance of critical thinking. Uh, particularly in a 21st century, as a 21st century competency. And this is a non-negotiable. This is fundamental. It's expected in all classes. We expect our students to be able to think critically. So we, have, we are trying to have a repertoire. In my opinion, we, we could do better here. Uh, critical thinking, again, is guided by uh, Richard Paul's elements of reasoning. Uh, we follow quite a bit of the inquiry process. It's quite evident in the classroom. But like, again, like I said, um, I think this is something that we could perhaps uh, look at and review a bit more to expand the range. Because if you want to differentiate instruction, you need to have a repertoire. But even as we do this, we ask these questions. Within RGS, are there differentiated provisions for different learners? Just now, uh, Julie hi highlighted this, that you know we have got students who are exceptionally uh, gifted, the really advanced learners, the, the geniuses, does this kind of approach cater to all of them? Are those with specific aptitudes or have other talents catered for? You know, some of our students are very good in their uh, humanity subjects. They may not be good in maths or science, but they're very good in their humanity subjects. How are they catered for? And I'm just going to let you look at this picture to tell that story. We're talking about diversity. These are students showing their inclinations their aptitudes in, in different ways. I mean, we've got students in leadership positions. Uh, we've also got students who dance and sing and who, are very, who excel in their sports. So this question of how do we provide for them? What framework do we use to provide for this diversity, even amongst this high ability profile? 
And to do this, again, we follow the approach uh, that we learned from uh, uh, levels of service. And again, this is an adaptation, an adaptation of the principle of levels of service. It's a talent development program framework. Level one would be one where you would cater to all students. And in this example would be research studies. All students, we teach all students the skills of doing research. Uh, and in year four, all students in year four have, can choose electives such as pharmaceutical chemistry, Arab-Israeli conflict, and these are uh, topics which may need not be examined. Level two is where we offer certain projects or certain provisions for many, not all, but many. An example would be a program like the Future Problem Solving Program. Level three, now this is getting a bit more advanced. Not all students could, um, the provision is for some of them, these would be the advanced classes. An example that we have is the Raffles Academy classes. These are for the, the geniuses in certain subjects. Then we have, this is when it get, really gets to be individualized and really gets to be challenging. Very few students would reach level four, but we have provisions for them. This is the off-grade advanced study. And these would be students who would go on to uh, on some mentorship with uh, professors or even may even have acceleration uh, programs. Yeah, so um, Julie now carry on with, and she'll help to round up this whole session. What I looked at was the details. Now she'll go back again to the whole big picture. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Thank you Mary. You. And I hope what Mary has shared really just encapsulates um, what we believe uh, as curriculum differentiation. Um, we, you know, RGS really is a unique classroom in the schools, in the school of Singapore, if you look at it that way. And all schools in Singapore do see their children very, very differently. We see our children's needs and therefore our response must be arising from locally made decisions based on understanding of our students' needs. So in, in RGS, that's, that's exactly what we've done. We've taken that journey away from the national curriculum because we know that these girls need something different. And Mary has given a sense of how there are certain principles, non-negotiables, that we believe are uh, necessary and important for every girl's learning needs, but we also have to respond to their very individually unique, uh, specific talents. Right? So it's differentiation within a differentiated school. But coming back to this, and I'd like to really just wrap this up, all of these plans will not sustain themselves without careful implementation, and that is I think the last point that Sir Michael Barber also reminded us about. 10% strategy, 90% implementation. Careful implementation. So curriculum innovation in RGS has largely been sustainable because of the following key features. You listen to Mary, and you do see that we take advice from learning from good practices, good frameworks, research, evidence-based frameworks. We've hired our own consultants, but we've taken their work and their ideas, and we've adapted those ideas to our local needs. Because our children are different from the children on whom those frameworks are based. So we've had to really ask ourselves, what are the principles that will not change? We know that they need critical thinking and therefore certain frameworks are in place. We know that they are high ability but they are all different and therefore levels of services for talent development must continue to be our focus. So it's always principle driven. Second point, everything is understood in the whole school manner. The strategy always is to take the entire school along with us on every new journey that we've taken, whether it's on talent development, curriculum development and design, assessment, understanding and literacy. We speak the same language, even the girls speak the same language as us. We use the same vocabulary and that has helped us to move a lot quicker. And in terms of training, everyone gets on board with training. So the teachers are moving along at the same place. This allows them to really be, you know, peer learning, peer understanding, greater ownership. This project isn't specific to science or math. Assessment, 
as a project, as a concept, is specific to all of us as educators in the school. So the whole school approach has, is, has been something that has worked very well for us and a key success factor in terms of sustainability. What does this mean in terms of new teachers who join the school? We take them through the entire process. They may not have been with us on that journey, but they are brought in with us on an understanding of how we came from point A to point B, and they are trained in all the systems and the frameworks that we apply in the school. Third point, we are never complacent. We do not ever want to sink into complacency because complacency means mediocrity in our efforts and our outcomes. So ongoing reviews are absolutely important. This time of year, I'm here with you, but my colleagues back in school are deep, deep in the work of year-end review. Every year ends with a review. Mary has spoken about curriculum maps. These maps are not put in the drawers or in cabinets. They don't remain on paper. They are translated in terms of delivery in the classroom. These maps are revisited every year by the departments led by the curriculum leaders and the heads. This is a really important process. And at the school level, review has become so important to us and Michael Barber alluded to this earlier, that we have started our own research arm, which is what Mrs. Cherian heads up. A research laboratory that focuses on what's going on in the RGS classroom. We put ourselves under scrutiny. We ask ourselves, what is working well and why is it working well? Can we transfer that success into other classrooms and perhaps to other schools? And this is a new journey that we've started because self-evaluation is the only way for improvement and reform. And we hope to be able to indigenize our own research and our own evidence-based frameworks so that it is evidence-based, good, excellent school systems that apply in the Asian context. So there's always constant tailoring to the demands and opportunities at each stage of the reform process. Is this work easy? No. Is this something that we are confident of 100% success? No. Do we keep trying? Yes. But try being very mindful of our challenges so that we continue always to look ahead. So what are our challenges? We constantly have to find ourselves modifying and sustaining teacher beliefs in what we do and teacher practices. It's very complex. And this must come from an understanding of the feel of the ground, how teachers are translating their work from the curriculum maps into the classroom. Teachers come and go, and we have to constantly make sure that that rigor and the standard that I talked about earlier, that common understanding of whole school approach, that must continue. So understanding teacher beliefs and how it drives their practice, that is challenge number one. Number two, we know that more can be done to help our students because there continues to be mixed abilities even within the same classroom and the same school. So heterogeneity, diversity is on the rise and therefore we cannot stay put at where we are, we have to constantly reinvent ourselves in order to respond better to their needs. Number three, catering to exceptional talents in our students requires very specific competencies. And therefore, even with our teachers who come to us highly qualified, very competent, high caliber teachers, we find that we have to constantly put them through professional development, they are constantly seeking out professional development and training because the girls are constantly pushing at the boundaries. And that keeps us very honest as educators in our classrooms. And these, therefore, are the challenges that we face. And I'd really like you know, to be able to hear from you what you think. And if you find that these are the same challenges that you face, because 
Our speakers have all reminded us this morning that education and improvements in education across the world must be a global effort. And what we have learned, we'd like to share. What you have to share with us, we would definitely find very valuable in terms of our own review and evaluation. And that takes us to the end of our presentation. And I'd like to thank you very much for being a very wonderful audience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any question from the floor, please? Thanks, Julie, for sharing your experience with us. Listening you talk made me think of this statement. Doing things right doesn't mean doing the right things. Because RGS, your Ruffle Girls School, is a school for gifted and talented girls, as you have pointed out. Now, after spending four years socializing with high achiever, talented people, what is it like when they go out to the real world, when they have to deal with people of all kinds of capacities and background? Thank you. Excellent question. You sound like one of my parents who have their daughters in the school. That is one of the key concerns we have for our girls. Um, I think you've rightly pointed out that being in the top strata uh, puts them into a very unique position. When you find yourself in a school that has individuals who are like you, as talented as you are, uh, essentially that means that your circle of interaction has shrunk. Am I right? You are interacting, therefore, with equally talented people. And that may distance you from those who are not quite so like you. And therefore, we keep an eye on whether they are able to understand and be a part of the larger world. We think about, we think about them in terms of whether they are able to interact with um, you know, other children. And we find, therefore, opportunities for them to be able to work with other children. We want to push them out into the new, into the real world. We want them to understand authentic problems. Mary spoke about um, a talent development program that we have for our girls, um, what we call future problem solving. In future problem solving, the girls have to go out and understand a real pressing need and they have to look for community agencies that advocate those needs. For, for instance, children from single-parent homes, what are their needs like? Or the problems of the elderly. They have to go out into the world to really work with these agencies to understand these needs. They meet with the actual individuals from these communities and arising from this, they interact with them and they better understand what research tells them about these communities. Now, future problem solving then requires our girls to be able to design the right questions to ask for themselves before they start designing the right answers to the problems faced by these communities. In so doing, we're hoping to be able to force them into more opportunities and more platforms to interact with the real world, even when they are with us in the four years. We do not want to erect these walls which keep them away from the real world and real society, because what is their talent for if not to give back to the larger world, right? So social responsibility is very important where we're concerned. And we tell these girls that your talent does not make you special at all or better than anyone else unless you are able to translate that into meeting real needs, into creating a better world. I'm not sure if those are the concerns that you, you raised, in, um, if I've been able to address those concerns. Training them as, uh, as you know, high ability individuals is a challenge, but helping them develop into full persons and women of character uh, women who will care about the world, whether they end up as CEOs or mothers, 
doesn't matter to us. You are a talented woman, you will make a contribution to the world, and if you do not understand your world, your contribution is so much less. So we put a very, very um, important emphasis on this, and that is one of our greatest concerns. Okay. Um, the time is running out, I think. Thank you. So I think we have to keep the question for the afternoon. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you.